All right. Introduce our characters, our actors. Uh, here is John Bradley. Next up, we have Rose Leslie. Christopher Kit Harrington. <laughs> Got Sophie Turner in the house. Natalie Dormer. Oh, the camera fans. We got a fella named George R. R. Martin. Maisie Williams. <laughs> Rory McCann. Gwendolyn Christie. <laughs> Nikolai Koster Waldo. <laughs> Pedro Pascal. And finally, our excellent moderator, Craig Ferguson. Uh, Thanks very much indeed for saying that, person who's not really telling the truth. I'm very happy to be here, everyone. Thank you, David and Dan, for introducing me last after these people camp out all night to see these people. And then at the very end, me. <laughs> I thought you understood dramatic structure. <laughs> it's very nice to be here. Welcome to San Diego. <laughs> which, as we know, is as far south as south goes. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember that? That's from season two, isn't it? <laughs> far south as south. I thought you guys knew about this. <laughs> uh, welcome to the big one. Now, of course, we're all here uh, to celebrate Game of Thrones. I, I understand that many of you people today will know uh, this show better than I do. Of course, these people do, and certainly you will. I know there are people who are fluent and Dothraki out there right now, but remember, we're all on the same side. How often do you uh, get, do you get to see each other at any point? There are all these different worlds that you exist. Do you guys ever get to hang out together? In the bar. In, in the, the bar? bar hotel, yeah. Is there a bar, like, somewhere that isn't in the title sequence that pops out if you know the right place to go? Yeah, it's, like, it's like the Star Wars bar, but it's Game of Thrones bar. I can imagine it probably is. <laughs> Full now, of White Walkers and stuff. The, uh, the thing is, you, uh, I'm surprised to see you here, Rory, given your, uh, what happened and, you know, as uh, you were left on the mountainside. Yeah, so, well, I'm still sore. I can't believe it. I'm here just. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, things weren't looking too good the last time I saw myself, so... <laughs> I thought he got off lightly. <laughs> <laughs> Nasty bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Which 
which one? Like me or her? <laughs> I can't believe I've been put between you two. I feel very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> George, may I ask you a question? Yes. When you began the creation of all of the, the this this world of Westeros and all of the attendant stories that happened around, did you envisage anyone to look like these people? Does it look like the world you first thought of? Does it feel like it? Well, uh, more or less, but of course not exactly. I mean, I started this in 1991, and uh, the the show. I didn't even have my first meeting with David and Dan until 2007, I believe it was. So there were like 16 years before the show was a twinkle in anyone's eye. Uh, and I had very strong pictures of what Westeros looked like and what the characters looked like. But uh, these people have brought the characters to like, uh, you know, uh, amazingly. Does it affect Does it affect your writing sense when you watch the show and you continue to write? Does it Does it you know, Does it inform what you do now? Not Not really, because I do have those sixteen years that sort of took deep root before the show came along. I, sometimes it gets a little tricky, but the show is the show, and the books are the books, and I All try right. to keep them separate. I know a few of the actors have read the books, but many of them don't. Were, uh, can I ask which uh, which actors here were uh, were, fa were were reading the books before they became uh, cast members on the show? Is that uh, something that you all do, or not? Or not, as the case may be, it certainly isn't a prerequisite. Um, obviously, um, there you are. You guys clearly were fans of the of the books, right? When did you first come in contact with them? When did we first uh, get the books? Eight years ago. Eight years ago. And how? That's a long time ago. It is a long time. And, and how did you manage to get it going with... Because uh, clearly this is something that costs a great deal of money to put together. How did you manage to talk HBO into this? Well, first we had to talk George into it. <laughs> right. So, um, and sorry, because some of you have probably heard the story before, but we had a very long lunch with George where we told him what we wanted to do with the adaptation. And, and uh, we had a three-hour talk. At the very end of it, George said, okay, okay, who is Jon Snow's real mother? <laughs> and there was a very long pause and I looked at Dan and Dan looked at me and we threw out a guess and uh, he kind of, he didn't say yes or no, but he sort of nodded and, uh, <laughs> and then he let us take the show. Who, who is Jon Snow's real mother? <laughs> this is Snow. <laughs> could, could be or else is, oh, never mind. All right. <laughs> Well, that's good. And so you shoot most of the time, and do you all shoot in Belfast all the time? Is that where you make everything? No, we shoot in Belfast year or through the entire shooting season, but we also have other foreign locations, which vary from year to year. This year, it's going to be Croatia and Spain. In past years, we've been in, in Malta and, and uh, uh, Morocco and Iceland and... The, the, the subject matter of the show can be, uh, from time to time, quite controversial. Is that something that, uh, you know, sometimes you go to a conservative area, perhaps where they aren't happy when they find out it's you guys filming that? That happened yes. this year. Yes, yes. We lost the location. I Dude. feel like, though, if the Bible thumpers yeah. stopped thumping the Bible for a minute and read it, they would see there's just as much incest in there. Mm. Wow. <laughs> a whole lot. We had a we, we lost a location this year to a man who did not want his property to be involved with porn of thrones. So, <laughs> uh, please remember the views expressed by David and Dan, and no way uh, represent my own views uh, <laughs> for legal reasons. Yes, they are. <laughs> so, uh, who's uh, may I ask by a show of hands who's still left alive in the cast? Um, no. Let's see. Yes. So we got about <laughs> halfway. Do you, uh, if I may ask first the actors who are still with us, do you, does it concern you when you receive the scripts that, you know, this may be it? Does it worry you that you... Yeah, um, I mean, some of us know roughly what happens in the books to our characters, but um, I know that David and Dan have killed characters that are still alive in the books and, and vice versa, so we never really know. Um, so I just suck up to both David and Dan and George <laughs> and just hope for the best, really. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Shit. The, the key lesson for the actors is never ask for a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a fair fight. Now, I think what we're going to do, I believe, is that we have uh, some new cast members that you wanted to talk about as well. Is that right? 
Sure. Yeah, yes. We uh, Big season coming up, a uh, whole bunch of new characters, and we thought they would say hello to you themselves. So. Yeah. Is that something that's going to happen now? Or, In, or maybe, oh, yeah. I guess, oh, it yeah, happens yeah, yeah. now. I'm Toby Sebastian and I'm playing Tristan Martel. People all over the world dream of being a part of this. So for me as an actor being cast alongside these fantastic people is um just really as good as it gets. Hi, my name is Nelsai Bafri. I'm going to be playing my solo Baratheon. I'm absolutely ecstatic to be given such an amazing opportunity. And I think it's going to be a, a bit of a challenge, but a really good adventure. Hi, my name is Delobia Opere, and I'm going to be playing the part of Era Hota. I'm looking forward to being a part of this incredible production. I'm completely stoked. Bring it on. My name is Enzo Chilenti, and I'm playing Yeza. I am frothing with excitement to be part of this epic, epic series. Hi, my name is Jessica Hennick, and I will be playing Nymeria Sam. What do I like most about my character? Her weapons. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rosabelle Lovanette de Sellers, but in Game of Thrones, I'm Tyene Sand. I can't wait to get on set, but in the meantime, I'm practicing with my double daggers. I'm Keisha Castle Hughes, and I'll be playing the role of a Mother Sand. I'm super excited to be on the show. I can hardly contain myself. My name's Jonathan Price. Oh. Hi, Spat. I'm very excited to be joining the cast of Game of Thrones with this new and fascinating character. Some of the characters that you'll be uh, getting attached to and watch die horribly over the next uh, 18 months. I don't really want to take up a whole lot of time from this panel today not giving you a chance to talk because obviously there are a great many members of the cast here. So uh, rather than me talking, I want to kind of throw it to the floor uh, quite quickly so that we can get as many questions as possible for the fans who have waited, as you say, overnight. So can we uh, start putting that together right away? And uh, when you come up to ask a question, please identify yourself and speak coherently and loudly. Yes, yes, David. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, if you do us a favor and don't ask us what's going to happen next season. Oh, yeah. No, obviously, there'll be no spoilers here. Fine. And also, if you do know what happens in the books and uh, then you want to ask questions about stuff that have, you know, hasn't reached that point in the series yet, grow up <laughs> <laughs> and don't. <laughs> All right? That's right. Very good, everyone. We're all friends. <laughs> We're all unsullied in a way, aren't we? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> all right, sir, may I ask your name and what your uh, question is? My name is Rick, and my question is for Mr. Martin. Um, as the creator of this universe, I'm wondering if there's any of the many gods or deities that you most closely associate yourself with. And if I may suggest one, perhaps the many-faced god, because you kill with utter impunity. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty of punity. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think I choose any one god over the other. And uh, my, my reputation for killing is, is exaggerated. Uh, as, I, as I like to point out that uh, David, David and Dan are far bloodier than I am. And uh, they've killed a number of, uh, uh, of characters who are still alive in the books. So, uh, you know, I may... I may only be the uh, second-ranked murderer here on the panel, uh, but uh, no, I, 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 I think religion is an important part of the world and should be depicted, but I'm not about to endorse one Westerosi religion as true over the others. There you are, then. Uh, 
George is the second best killer on the panel, apparently. <laughs> yes, may I ask uh, what your name is, young lady? Hi, my name is Lila. Hi, Lila. Lila Matisse. Are you Dathraki? You've got lovely hair. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. <laughs> my question is for Kit Harrington. Kit Harrington. He's got lovely hair. <laughs> Even though you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I wanted to ask you, um, what do you do to prepare for your roles um, on the wall, you know, before battle scenes, also in the freezing cold, and just what do you do beforehand to prepare? I think, um, I think with, with Thrones, it's weird. A lot of the work is done for you before you even get there. And I think a big part of that for me is costume because we have such wonderful costumes on this show that when I find, uh, put it on, and it's got a certain weight to it, a certain sort of gives a certain gravity that I, I kind of, it's weird, I'm about to go back and start my first day on Monday, which is really exciting and I've got a great scene, but it's, it's odd, I've just had my hair dyed and everything and I, I get back into that costume and it's very sort of, very grounding, that's kind of how I, how I kind of fall into Jon Snow, it's not very an exciting. And process. the hair products, right? <laughs> Say again. The hair products? <laughs> hair products, yeah. yeah. Yeah, many, many hair products. <laughs> okay. well, I could ask the same of uh, John and Rose, who are uh, north of the wall with you as well. You guys, are you working in heavy cause? Is it always that cold? Or do you have to act cold in those? Uh... No, I mean, we were, we were in, you know, the northern part of Iceland for the majority of season two and three. And so there, it was absolutely freezing. So there's very little acting involved when we were cold. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, there were times when we were shooting like minus 40. Uh, but we had these thermals underneath the costume and so that definitely helped. Right. And then you had a big fat cloak on, so that was fine. <laughs> that helped. Um, but no, it is, it is beautiful and it was mesmerizing being in Iceland, but it uh, kind of cold is, it kind of wakes you up and makes sure that you, you know. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. envy you it at all. The same for you? Yeah, I, I think that um, what this show really excels in is putting the actors into the same environment as the characters would find themselves. If the characters are that cold, we tend to be that cold. And when, when we were in Iceland, especially, we thought that we were walking on the ground. We were actually walking on five feet of like, compacted snow. So if you get my costume, which weighs a fair amount on its own, put me in it, <laughs> which, which, you know, is never going to help anything, and then... <laughs> Then have me charging across a glacier being chased by a, a camera on a quad bike. Chances are that by the end of the day, I've been driven into the ground like a tent peg. <laughs> That's it. And, and, you know, people say, oh, yeah, but th those costumes must really keep you warm. And they do, but from the neck down. And as an actor, your tool, pardon the expression, is... Um, <laughs> your face is your tool, which... <laughs> Yeah, all right. All right, no, 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 no. Not in America. It means something different okay. here. No, 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 I understand. I understand. I'll reiterate Craig's uh, sentiments, um, grow up. Um, um, but you find your performance completely compromised because you can't be subtle at all because your face is freezing up, literally freezing up. And at minus 35, you're at work and you think, okay, I, if I'm ever this cold again in my life, Something's gone fairly badly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, there you go. Uh, may I ask, uh, yes, your name? Hi, my name is Jacob. Hi, Jacob. What's your question? Well, I have so many questions for all of the... Um, yeah, but you only get one, Jacob. So what one is it? <laughs> so, um, but my question's for the masterminds behind the show, George, David, and Dan. Um, as the pacing of the show has really sped up and caught up with almost to where A Dance of Dragons is. Um, how will you go forward planning this throughout the next few seasons and years? As uh, Will it surpass the books as far as the timeline? Or which one will end first? Are we going to wait? Jacob, it's a fantastic question. And uh, we can't answer without telling you <laughs> what's going to happen. So, uh, do you want to? Do you want? Should we give Jacob an alternate question? Because yeah, yeah, you can ask one of the many other questions that you said you had, Jacob. <laughs> so many questions you had, you asked the one we can't answer. <laughs> oh man! Well, uh, how is it working in all of the different sets, and 
How do you manage to bring together all these different stories, twisting and turning into one great arc that just has an epic feel to it? And it's, it's a real world. It's a whole world. Wow. Yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, how, how do you do it, actually? Well, I mean, it all starts in George's mind. It all started in George's brain. Um, how many years ago? George, 30 years ago? 1991. 1991 wasn't it, George? 30, you see that? 33 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, the, those characters, every single character uh, sitting up here at this table started out in uh, some dark region of, of George's mind. And can, I, <laughs> can I ask you, George, because, George, you named all the places in, in Westeros. Why do they all sound a little bit like artisanal cheese farms? There you get... <laughs> You got King's Landing, you've got uh, Winterfell, you got all of them sound like they make a fairly decent cheese. I like cheese. <laughs> Seems fair. Fromage, yes. <laughs> I don't know, you know, naming things in fantasy is very hard, uh, you know. I, I, not only do we have Westeros, but we've recently came out with a map book where they wanted me to draw maps of the entire world. And we have the world of Ice and Fire coming out in October, which is like a concordance. And, you know, I, I'm drawing up maps for places like thousands of miles to the east where the story will never go. And I'm I'm just running out of names. Why, the Pointy <laughs> Mountains, the 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 Sharp and the Misty Mountains. No, Tolkien used the Misty Mountains. Uh, <laughs> The the really Cheesy big mountains, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you you do the best you can, and, and it, it, you're doing very well, George. I didn't mean you to think that I was criticizing. Yes, it looks like we have an emissary from another kingdom. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> nice. Hello. This, hey guys, this question uh, better be for me. You know it. <laughs> uh, I'm Eric. This is Angie. Uh, first, I want to say, do you know why the, all the world hates a Lannister? <laughs> we all know why. <laughs> My question is for Pedro. Uh, can you describe the process of preparing for the big battle in episode nine, eight? You guys look amazing, by the way. Yeah, you look very good. Don't, may I say, I, I think on behalf, I speak on behalf of most of us here, Pedro, how delighted we are to see you uh, intact. Yeah. <laughs> you're, uh... <laughs> um, the, the HBO team set me up with a master of wushu very early in the process, actually, and put me into some training with a, a guy named Master Hu in Los Angeles. And then, of course, I was uh, on set in Belfast doing extensive rehearsals with C.C. Smith and the fight team and Hapthor, the, the other actor. And I had an amazing double. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah. But, I could ask the same, actually, of uh, Nikolai, Gwendolyn, and Rory, actually. And, and uh, the, you're all uh, a lot of fight scenes, a lot of very complicated and difficult-looking fight scenes. Did you do that before the show? Is it a skill you learned in drama school? Or is it, uh, are you actually swordy in your life? Swordy. <laughs> yeah, I've always been really swordy. You're swordy? <laughs> yeah, I was just drawn to it when I was about three, four months old. And... <laughs> <laughs> found I developed an aptitude with it, and then this part came up, and it seemed like my whole life it's was a natural working fit. towards it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they train us really intensively. We work with an amazing, amazing stunt team, all of us, who are very patient and deal with us with a great deal of humor, particularly me, who can be a bit slow. It takes a while for it to sink in. Um, and you work hard, but it's always with the goal that you want it to be as brilliant as it possibly can be, and they facilitate that. Yes, same for you, Nikolai? Yes, you I mean, I had a, a great teacher once called Dave Huckaday, who was just amazing, um, and, uh, but that was years ago. Uh, he's in Leeds now, um, but apart from in that- In Leeds, you say? Yes. Wow, well, you need a sword in Leeds. I need a sword yeah. in Leeds, yeah, you do. Um, but I think I was just going to say, because I was those two fights, what Gwen and Rory did and, and Pedro, it was just, wasn't that just amazing? Yeah, it was extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> extraordinary. I mean, I, I didn't go to drama college and I didn't learn sword fighting, but I grew up in Glasgow and we, we, <laughs> we don't use swords. We use a thing called a chib. Yes, yeah, I remember them well. It's like a sword. It's a, but, you know, it's got nails at the end of the stick, you know. And that, that seems to do the trick. Yeah, I spoke to Gwen after your fight. She was in tears. Yeah, sorry. She beat her up. <laughs> she beat me up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> A 
can I ask maybe uh, down further down about Natalie and Sophia? You get jealous of the uh, of the sword play? Do you ever uh, wish you could get a little more in the way of kind of brutal killing action going on? Yeah, I want to kill someone. Yeah, <laughs> isn't she adorable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um... I really, I was talking to Gwen just backstage about her fight. I thought, I'm a massive Rob Roy, that movie. There's a fight in Rob Roy. Oh, great fight. It's great a fantastic fight. sword fighting thing. I was really into swords when I was in my 20s. So as Marjorie, I did get a bit frustrated when I first started, but she's proven to have other weapons. <laughs> but um, uh, I was just complimenting um, Gwen on that fight because you can count on one hand, I think, when I watch films and see plays, I'm always really interested in the authenticity of the violence. And that's what's great about Game of Thrones violence is it's disturbing because it's so real and accurate, naturalistic. And I thought that was a particularly amazing fight. And I asked about the sword holding moment. And you said that Cece, um, the stunt guy who created the fight, actually does love the film Rob Roy yeah. and had nicked that moment of holding the sword and the hand bleeding. It was a really nice nod, a nice yeah, reference. Yeah. I thought it was an outstanding fight. We're, hey, Natalie, we're the ones who ripped off Rob Roy, yeah. not CC. <laughs> we stole that moment from. Sorry. Uh -huh. Just to clarify. You were I'm not supposed to tell anybody then. about that. But yes, exactly. It's, <laughs> For it's, legal reasons, they're just kidding. It's the moment that Liam, Sorry, Neeson, Liam Neeson grabs the sword, and we totally stole it. And you weren't supposed to tell anyone that. <laughs> Well, the sword play is excellent. And uh, may I ask, Maisie, could you point out on Rory where the heart is? There you are. <laughs> you still got it. All right. Why yes, didn't sir. You do it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Martin. Good afternoon, Hi. cast of Game of Thrones. Uh, my name is Gerald, and I'm here representing the Hall H. Posse. <laughs> oh, I, my question is for Mr. Martin and the cast. Uh, Mr. Martin, you've populated the world of Westeros with many unique, wonderful, and terrifying people. Uh, when writing about the characters, has, uh, when writing about the triumphs and tribulations of the characters, has that helped you discover something about yourself or help you overcome a real-life challenge? Uh, and if so, can you share that with your fans? And to the cast, uh, which cast in the show uh, is most like you and why? That's like five questions, man. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a lot of questions. Uh, you know, you draw on yourself, particularly for the viewpoint characters. Uh, you, you may base them on people you know, on figures from history, uh, on your imagination. But ultimately, to make a character come alive when you're writing from inside them, you have to delve into yourself. Fortunately, uh, you know, I am large. I contain multitudes, as I think Walt Whitman said. Always steal from the best. So uh, a lot of different characters can can be pulled from inside one. Uh, and uh, I, I'm different from many of the characters. I've never been a, an exiled princess or a dwarf or an eight-year-old girl. But uh, uh, I think the uh, common humanity uh, unites all these characters, and we all we all have that in common. That's what I try to draw on when creating characters. Are you a student of uh, history, George? Do you study European history? Oh, yes. History? Yeah, because it seems like there are echoes of a lot of European, you know, the wall and a lot of the, you know, the way that the world is put together is very like, you know, from, uh, I guess, early European on. Is it something that fascinated you? A lot of, a lot of Game of Thrones is stolen from your Scottish history. I know, uh, I know. A particularly uh, bloody and uh, dispiriting history that you have there up in Scotland. Yes, I, know. <laughs> I, I live in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the Black Dinner and the Glencoe Massacre. I yeah, drew on yeah. both of those for the Red Wedding. Good times. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Why, we have a crew. We have a crew. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is John. And my <laughs> question no <is> kid. <laughs> yeah. My question is for Rose and Kit. Uh, what do you think was going on through the heads of your characters when they saw each other again at the Battle of the Wall? Oh. That's, that is a, a great question and a brilliant outfit. Congratulations. <laughs> Brother, that's great. Well done. Um, I, um, I don't know. I think it was an important moment for us. Um, and I think it was, a, I think what, was, what I wanted to try and capture is that he's just very happy to see her again, really, at the heart, at the heart of it. After everything that's happened, he doesn't really care in some ways if that arrow is loosed and he dies. 
he, he got to see her one last time. And I think that that moment is obviously broken with what happens next. But I, um, yeah, I think it's a beautiful moment for him. It's quite a profound silence. There's a silence there we wanted, we wanted to get, I think. But I agree. I... Thanks, man. <laughs> 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 but it's very true. I mean, I think that there was that silence that you were talking about that it became very profound. And I think certainly for Egret throughout season four, you know, she was she was on a ruthless mission and she was going to get her own back with Jon Snow. And I don't think she at all anticipated just how much she loved him and just that hesitation seeing him again completely through her. And I don't think she foresaw that at all. And of course, that was, you know, her, her last kind of breath, as it were. But... Um, but yeah, no, it was a very beautiful moment. And we didn't really want to discuss much about it on the day when we shot it. We kind of just wanted to see how it would organically kind of flow. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Very nice. Very nice. So are yes. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, gentlemen in uh, alarmingly ordinary clothing. <laughs> thank, thank you. Hi, Natalie and the rest of the cast. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I wonder who sorry. your question's for. <laughs> oh, my question's for George. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the one thing I've always wanted to ask you for years is, um, Hodor? <laughs> Hodor. That's it. <laughs> Hodor. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, now I feel a little more comfortable. Well, hello to you. <laughs> Hi, what's your question, girlfriend? <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Dan. <laughs> um, my question is for uh, Dan and Dave. Mm. Uh, now that Stannis has arrived at the wall, can we look forward to more scenes developing his character for Stannis the Manus? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I tell him? Do you want to tell him? I think we can say we can say yes. Oh yeah, you in can. violation yeah, of our earlier. Yeah. Yes, we can say yes. You can. Because I was going to say that, and then you would have he's, to say what about what was going to happen. Well, he's a, we can say he's a fascinating character, Stannis? and he's amazingly well drawn by Stephen Delane, and we will be taking advantage of uh, both the character and the actor in the season to come. I'd be careful about that woman that's with him, though. She worries me. <laughs> Celine. She doesn't worry you. She has her moments. She worries me. I don't think she's all about being good at all. <laughs> Are any of us? Really? Odor. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my question is for George. Um, I was wondering, with the show getting close to catching up with the books, what would you say to fans who are planning to stop watching the show once it gets into content from book six and seven, so that they can experience the story in its true format. Would you encourage us to just watch the show anyways, or would you encourage us to wait until the books comes out and then watch the show? Yes, I, I encourage everyone to watch the show. <laughs> uh, we'd like to announce we're here to ask you to stop watching the show <laughs> until we're ready for you to start again. I do also encourage people to read the books. <laughs> Reading the books is good. <laughs> um, you know, that I, the question of, so you can experience the story in its true form uh, <clears throat> is kind of a loaded one. You know, I've, I've said a couple times in post, the riddle, uh, how many children does Scarlett O'Hara have? Um, Scarlett O'Hara, has three children in Margaret Mitchell's novel. Scarlett O'Hara has one child in the classic movie of Gone with the Wind. How many children does Scarlett O'Hara have? What's the true story? Of course, the true story is Scarlett O'Hara has no children because she never existed. <laughs> She's a fictional character, and there are two wonderful classic ways of telling a story. And, uh, you know, that may be the situation... Uh, that is the situation with the, the show is the show and uh, the book is the book, you know. Who did Rob Stark marry? Did she marry, did he, she marry a noble woman from Volantis named Talisa who died at the Red Wedding or did she marry, did he marry a woman named Jen we Jane Westerling who's still alive and will be seen in the prologue of uh, Winds of Winter. Um, Is one true? Is one not true? Well, you know, how many children did Scarlett O'Hara have? <laughs> there you are. All right. 
Is that go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On you go. Yeah, well, I wasn't shaking my fist at you. It was a him. You're fine. It's an honor. For now. Um, so my question is, I guess, open for anybody. If you guys could kind of walk us through what the production process is like, because we're assuming that the shooting schedule is all over the place. So how is it kind of moving from episode to episode and going back and forth? You shoot out of sequence, I presume, right? Everything's shot. We do. Yeah, we shoot it as if it's a 10-hour movie. So, so uh, we sometimes, last year, we shot uh, scenes from the 10th episode in the first week. And uh, we shoot in three different countries this year, in, in Ireland, Spain, and Croatia. Uh, five different directors shooting two episodes each. And uh, the actors have to kind of travel all over the place. So it's, it's in, in the way, it's called cross-boarding, which is just an expression meaning that, you know, Basically, wherever is the best time for a scene to shoot, it's going to shoot. And and two separate units, the dragon unit, the wolf unit, is really boring stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think it's a valid question in the sense it's that I mean, if I can throw it to the actors who are, uh, who are playing characters who are now deceased in the series, have, did you shoot your death scenes in sequence? Did you have to come back and shoot, you know, uh, other scenes after you had been, uh, had your head squeezed and your eyes popped out? My, um, for example? My, my very first day on set was the uh, cell scene with Tyrion. Um, it was wow. the, uh, you know, my big scene. Yeah. And um, I was petrified. Thanks a lot, David. <laughs> um, it, it, it was my first day on set. It was my first day in full costume. And um, I, I, I don't know how the hell I got through it, to be honest with you. It was, it was, it was pretty nerve-wracking, but um, Peter made it really easy. And Alec, the, uh, the director, um, took care of me. But it was totally... And from that point, I mean, it, it, it sort of like was diving in right at the gate and um and that was my that was my intro into the season and then we were all over the place the fight sequence came a little towards the end so that that helped a little bit yeah what about you rory and, and yeah. rose was that was that your story as well? well i was lucky i i think my last days were like the last days of <laughs> woof 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 <laughs> <laughs> there's a dire wolf <laughs> Hound. I know exactly what that dog said. You know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's an unusual thing. Normally, it's all higgledy pickledy, but uh, the fight and the death was um, that was at the end. Luckily, I'm working with Maisie, and she knew what what was going on because I get very confused. <laughs> What about you, Rose? Was that your story? Did you shoot the death scene towards the end of, yes. the, of the shoot? Yeah. Yes, like scheduling and production were very lovely in that respect because they, um, my final day ever on the show was the time, well, was the scene when I died in Kit's arms. And so luckily having shot that, I didn't then have to, you know, turn up in two days' time and be like, hi, I'm back. <laughs> so um, that was, yeah, that was my final day and then that was it. Thank you. Yes, yes. Oh, hi. Uh, since most uh, serious questions have been asked, I wanted to ask uh, Wendelin, uh, what was it like uh, to bite the hound's ear off? And so Rory doesn't feel left out. What was it like to uh, <laughs> downstairs kick uh, Brienne? <laughs> downstairs kick. Downstairs kick? That's just the sort of language we will not tolerate here, sir. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. What was it like, Rory? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good fun. It was really good. <laughs> I've never done it before. I've always wanted to. <laughs> but uh, here's a little secret. They, we, did we do that? I think the idea was to put a strap in between your knees so when you were crawling in that one move, I could take a right good run at it. And, <laughs> and, but we would still keep it safe. We didn't do that, though, did we? Well, actually, no, we didn't, did we? <laughs> So what did you she, do? Oh, it was. Remember you, you when when she punched me. Um, that there was connections going on there oh. uh, between the legs and best moment of my life. It was horrible. <laughs> but when she bit when she bit my ear, it, second best moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of tickled, to be honest. Literally, it's like get off me. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm saying. Hello. Hi. My name is Jason. Good for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So I recently read an article where Kit Harrington said that he wanted to see more male nudity in the show. No, no, no. Oh, so yeah, first of all, what are you going to do about that? And second, what does yeah, everyone what are you gonna else do about that, think? Kent? 
What, what was second? Because I'm going to go for What does one. everyone else think? Uh, yeah. If we can throw it open for general discussion to the panel, would we like to see more male nudity right uh, on. on the show? Oh, Jesus yes. Christ. <laughs> Yeah. Equality. I'm, I'm very aware that anything I say right now is being listened to by the men at that end of the table. <laughs> so I'm going to shut up and not say a thing <laughs> so I don't have to get my kit off next season too, <laughs> too fully. Exactly. <laughs> you see, you can't really lose with me because... <laughs> it's, no, be careful what you wish for. Um, no, please. Go on, John. Yeah! Oh, no, no, please. Take him on. No, 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 no. I refuse to bow down to public pressure. The good thing, <laughs> but the good thing about me and male nudity is that um, everybody is served because it'll still get the boob count up. <laughs> everybody wins. How's about that then? <laughs> I hope that answers your question sufficiently. <laughs> yes, madam. Oh, wow. Hi, I want to ask the whole cast, dragons or dire wolves? Ah. Let's begin at the very end with you then, uh, uh, John. Let's start with you. Uh, dragons or dire wolves? Um, I'm going to gonna, I'm gonna have to be loyal to my storyline, be loyal to my... My compadre and say die wolves, of course. Die wolves. Same for you. Uh, I am wolves? going to disagree and go for dragons. What? Yeah. I'm shocked. Kit? Die wolves. Of guys. course. <laughs> Sophie? Die wolves. Really, dragons are me. dangerous now. Like. <laughs> 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 no. Natalie? Die wolves. George, you have a favorite? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Direwolves. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Dragon! Yes. Direwolves. <laughs> Easier to kill. <laughs> what did you say? I don't know. Mm. Snakes. <laughs> Gentlemen, do you have a favorite? No. Don't play favorites. Fair enough. Uh, all right, there you are. I hope there you go. I hear uh, that the dragons are easier to work with, right? Yeah, they do what you tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, but no, well, never mind. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Howdy. Hi. Uh, quick question. So, obviously, the book and the show don't always go hand in hand, but there was a major character reveal that sort of happens at the end of book three. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering... Can't talk you, about that? Can't talk about it? Blatant violation of the rules. Get out. <laughs> Get out. I don't know. We can't... Obviously, I can't help you with that. I can't believe he did that. You know, after all I said. Uh, Somebody nip down there and stab him, would you? <laughs> 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 yeah, all right. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, wow. What are you doing? Really loud. I'm just <laughs> what are you doing with that thing with there? The oh, it's a um, You get the wrong panel. <laughs> well, I do what I can. Right. Anyway, one, you guys are all amazing, and thank you for sitting here and asking, answering inane questions from us all day. But my question is for Sophie. Um, because I feel like Sansa Stark gets a lot of crap that she does not deserve. Um, Sansa is badass and awesome. And I've been annoying my roommates all weekend, like Team Sansing all over the place. <laughs> so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit how you came to you envision her journey from where she started to where she ended up at the end of this season, which was just amazing. And I think even, I'm sorry for saying this, George, a little bit of a step up from the book. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Uh, when you're stabbing the other guy, stab her as well when you're done. <laughs> Um, I never really, like, when I was, like, 13, I didn't really think, okay, this is the way my character's going to go, and she's going to end up like Maleficent, and it's going to be great. <laughs> um, but uh, when I started, yeah, I didn't have a plan for her. I just kind of, it sounds really gross and pretentious, but I kind of grew with her as an actress while she grew as a character. Um, 
And then, I mean, it's really down to the writing of both George and, you know, David, Dan, Brian, Cogman, Vanessa. Um, and when I got the script through for season four, it was like, it was such a relief because for the past, like, three seasons, she's been deceiving with the facade of her former self for so long. And it was such a relief for me to finally be able to, like, shed the skin and become this somewhat manipulator that she actually is from being, you know, at court with Cersei and Tywin, and she finally gets to reveal herself. It was freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mwah. Yes, young lady. Uh, my question is for George. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's asked about how um, the fight between Brienne and the Hound felt for the characters and the actors, but how did that separation from the book feel for you? Well, it was a great scene. Um, you know, that David and Dan have, have uh, and the other writers, Brian Cogman was mentioned, he deserves a lot of credit too, uh, have added some scenes that are not in the book, um, in part because there are no viewpoint characters present uh, in every season uh, that I've loved. Uh, the first season, the, the scene between uh, Robert and Cersei where they discuss their marriage, not in the books, but a terrific scene. Second season, uh, the, in the Blackwater episode, the wonderful scene in, with Bronn confronts the Hound in the brothel, terrific scene. And I, I put this, the, the battle in the, same, in the same category. It was just great television, and it was, uh, it was terrific to uh, watch. Uh, you know, the things I mourn are, for the most part, the scenes that didn't make it. You know, I, I've been pretty open since uh, before season one, and I wish we had three more episodes a season. Uh, it would, of course, kill David and Dan. I realize that. But, uh, you know, it, it would give us a parody with some other HBO shows and enable us to include some of the stuff that gets cut. But uh, the stuff, some of the stuff that gets added, particularly when it's as great as that scene, uh, I, I love it. Can I, can I ask uh, you all a question while we're here? Because there have been a lot of questions for uh, George, obviously, about the separation with the books and the shoes. How many of you, perhaps by, uh, by applause, have read the books? So let's go another way. How many of you, by applause, have not read the books? How many of you know the story of Westeros? By applause. I think probably all of you. Uh, and I think that the information, it's interesting that I'm, I'm watching the, the separation of the two, I find quite fascinating. Is there, a, is there a loyalty between, uh, do the people who have read the books, do you feel that you're more advanced and more a part of the world than the people who have not? <laughs> I, I mean, it's a genuine question. I, I, I wonder if you are, are you? I'm leaving San Diego today. <laughs> Yes, Jack Sparrow. <laughs> Captain, <laughs> Captain, Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow. You know, Jack Sparrow. <laughs> First in line for the uh, Pirates 5 panel, right here, waiting outside. <laughs> Anyways, this goes right into my question, more of like a praise. I'd like to give a round of applause to you guys for doing, I mean, how many times have we said, the book is so much bloody better? Pretty much because we want to prove that we can read, but mostly... We say that all the time, and for the first time ever, I've never heard one person say that. This show is just as brilliant. Give them a round of applause for these guys. It's amazing work what you've all done to do that. You're, you're a much deeper man than you are in the pirate movies, if I may say. <laughs> I am not drunk right now, so okay. when that goes in, then I get a little short change on it. But the reason I look like this is because tonight there is a Game of Thrones costume party on a pirate ship. Wanted to invite all of you. Your names are already on the list. Everybody in the hall, you're invited too to come have a bottle of rum. Bring me rum. Martmanparty.com tonight. Hope to see you. Th thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> and uh, when you're stabbing the other two, <laughs> g give him a quick stab when you're down there as well. <laughs> oh, hello. Hi, what's Hi. your name? Hi, um, I'm Catherine, mm -hmm. and this question is for my beloved Sophie Turner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the episode of Joffrey's wedding, um, you and Tyrion seem to start getting kind of close, 
And I was wondering what you think of Sansa and Tyrion's relationship now that they are separate. I think it's devastating. He was my other half. Um, <laughs> we loved each other so much. You can feel the love. Um, but they really did actually begin to have this genuine bond and trust with each other. And it was just getting kind of beautiful. And then um, in the spirit of Game of Thrones, they cut that off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I mean, I would like in the future for them to be reunited at some point. Um, because I think they'd be a pretty awesome like power couple in the future. Um, like the new Brangelina. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, it was a really lovely relationship and she was finally beginning to trust him and uh, love him, not in that way, but, you know, as just a person. And um, they were really on each other's team. And I love your outfit. <laughs> you look great. Thank babes. you. <laughs> what may I say with a lovely dress? What was that? <laughs> no, no, I didn't ask you a question. I just said your dress was nice. That's all right. Off you go. <laughs> Hello, what? that's a nice outfit too. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for coming. You guys are my favorite characters, literally everyone who's up there. Um, my question is for Maisie. Um, <laughs> Arya has had to change her identity to survive so many times, like Ari and Nan, and now that she's finally on her own, like going where she wants to go, uh, how do you, do you feel that she's still attached to who she is as a Stark, or do you think that she's someone new entirely, or how do you play that? She is no one. <laughs> By the way, I believe, uh, I believe Sean Bean's in town. Anybody seen him? <laughs> That is the joke, man. He's fine. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Thank you so much for bringing what a wonderful world into everyone's lives. And why did you stop looking for Benjamin? <laughs> <laughs> you asking? Are you asking ben kid? Benjamin Stark here. Why did you stop looking for me? <laughs> John, that was Kit's idea. <laughs> Who says I'm really, I'm, I don't know whether he ever will come back, but I hope he does. I love, um, I love Benjamin. I think I just got, you know, distracted with other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> distracted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oscar. It's busy. Uh, I think we've got time for, uh, yeah, maybe one more. Uh, yes. Hello, you. <laughs> This is my sexy Ingrid costume. Right. Um, <laughs> you look amazing. Thank you. Yeah. You'd um, be a little cold north of the wall wearing that, though. <laughs> I, I figured this was Ingrid in the cave. Oh. I seem to remember Ingrid in the cave weren't wearing much of anything at all, as I remember. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to come up and say thank you for creating such an amazing show and books. It gives us a fantasy to take home that is a little bit more real. So um, my mom back here and I wanted to come and say thank you for everything. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Let's, take, let's take one more. We can do one more. Uh, come on up. That was a lovely question, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. Oh. I had a, a question about a, a difference that the show took from the book. Um, in the show, I'm not going to ruin it for anybody, don't worry. But in the show, when Jamie releases Tyrion, um, it's kind of a short scene. But in the book, he uh, had an exchange with Tyrion that really changed the dynamic of the relationship. And I was wondering, what was the creative reasons uh, behind the omission of that scene? Well, that's, that's got to be for you guys, I think. Although I have to, as uh, someone, uh, before they even answer, I think that that, that relationship was established, that change was established in numerous scenes leading up to the point, the, at least that's what I thought watching it. I was like, no, I get it. I get that it's changed. But uh, what do you think? 
You know, I think, I think sometimes in an adaptation from a book, um, there are certain things you're going to lose. And, and one of the problems is we don't have access to the character's mind. So there's an amazing relation, there's an amazing backstory for Tyrion, which we learn about basically because we're inside Tyrion's skull. And we have pages and pages where we learn exactly what happened. And it's a really powerful moment of the story. The problem is the only way for us to do it in the show would be either through dialogue or through action. We're not going to have a flashback showing that scene. We haven't had any flashbacks yet and we didn't want to have voiceover. So unless we had a long scene with dialogue explaining what happened all those years ago, which just felt like it wasn't going to work, um, that was something that went by the wayside. And there are all sorts of these, of these cuts that are uh, incredibly difficult for us because oftentimes they're, they're bits from the books that, that we love the most. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to work on screen when we've got 540 minutes to tell a whole season. And just, you know, this kind of goes hand in hand with the call before for extra episodes believe us from a storytelling point of view we'd love to have 13 episodes that would be fantastic the problem is the, the problem is we can't um we actually we finished post-production and we've already started up post uh, pre-production on the next season we there's there's absolutely no downtime between the end of one season and the start of the next uh there's just no time for us to to shoot more episodes and maintain the kind of qual quality in terms of production value going to all the different countries and getting those locations having the visual effects guys create the dragons all that stuff so unless we find some really good divorce lawyers yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, I, I that, that, that's not going to help you either i speak from some experience <laughs> <laughs> just do what you need to do but i think that's you know and george said before read the books i think that's one of the one of the things that we always hope is that people who haven't read the books but watched the show then might be drawn to the books which we think is true for a lot of people and then they they can learn a lot more about these characters than they ever would watching the show alone and and get much more uh depth and and time to spend with those characters and learn all about them so um unfortunately as as, as hard as we try we can't possibly match the uh, the amount of detail and, and storytelling in a 1,200-page book uh, over the course of the season. And, and I guess the last thing I would say is that when we first talked to George, uh, when we first got the books, they were sent to us to adapt as feature films. And the idea was that each book would be one feature. So if you can imagine that Game of Thrones as a two-and-a-half-hour movie, just think about everything that would, have been, that would have been mutilated and cut out of that story. And one of the reasons we really wanted to do this as a show, and luckily George agreed with us, was even though we couldn't have everything, at least we could have 10 hours for each of those books. And in the case of Storm of Swords, 20 hours. Um, and even then, you know, we're amazed to find out how much of the, of the detail we just can't get in there. So. I think it was, I'm always reminded, I think it was Jim Thompson, the great crime novelist who had a, a reporter ask him, how do you feel? about what Hollywood has done to your books. And he pointed to his bookshelf and he said, Hollywood hasn't done anything to my books. They're right there. You know, yeah. and oh, their yeah. books are always going to be their own pristine that's, world. There's nothing's going to change. And I think that's an excellent point at which uh, we have to finish, unfortunately. The books exist and will always exist. The show exists and it will always exist. Thank you so much uh, to you guys for showing up. And to you guys as a, an audience member and a fan of the show, thank you so much for uh, coming to San Diego. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Thank Craig. you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you for coming to Game of Thrones panel.